My name is Rick Fissett and this is part three in the video series on how to understand and debug test coverage issues in the Tessent ATBG tools. In this example, we'll look into the details of a couple more fault categories and debugging scenarios. So first of all, we have 84% relevant coverage, which is quite low and it's due to all of these ATBG untestable faults. So the AU breakdown, looking at black boxes, half a percent may be significant, but not just yet. That's not the big issue. The bigger issue is really the, the tide cells. Uh, the tide cells uh, account for uh, over 8% of the design. Now, these are different from tied faults. Tied faults are tied in the netlist to a, a 1 or a 0, and so that's done by design. Tied cells are actually uh, register elements that behave like they're tied to 1 or 0 or X as a result of having simulated the test setup procedure in input constraints. Now, the test setup is what essentially initializes the design and puts it into the desired test mode or scan mode. Now, in some cases, you expect to have to initialize your boundary scan logic to put you in the right mode, um, and so you'll see some faults that are AU as a result of that. But over 8% is pretty high. So we want to take a look at the details of that and maybe under, start understanding what's going on. So what we can see here for each of the tied cells, we can break it down. We actually list the path name of the tied cell, the register. We actually give it a gate ID because these path names can be quite long sometimes. And then we say whether it's a tie X, a tie 0, or a tie 1. And just looking at the path names, a couple of them are associated with boundary scan logic, so that's not necessarily surprising. Then we see a lot associated with memory bis logic. Um, I wouldn't always expect to see quite that much due to memory bis logic, so I think it's fair to question whether or not all of that should be initialized. So one way you can take a look at this is you can take a look at the individual faults. So if we uh, write faults to, uh, let's give it a file name, AU underscore TC, all right, and we want to do uh, the dash class AU because these are AU faults. The subcategory is TC, and if we want to actually report on a specific tied cell, we can give it the gate ID, like so, all right, and if we can look at AU uh, TC, the fault name, uh, we essentially, we can confirm that a lot of these faults really are in the memory bis logic. So again, this leads you to think that you really should question whether or not all of that initialization of memory bis logic is necessary because you're, until you address that, you're, you're going to lose test coverage. You won't be able to get that back. So that's one category that you want to dive into. Now, another really significant category is this AU unclassified. So a lot of questions about this. Why is it unclassified? Well, this is essentially the way we used to report AU several years ago before we had any of these subcategories at all. If it's a category that we recognize and can do automatic analysis on, we'll break it down in here. There are some categories, though, that we don't have the automatic analysis for yet. So we'll put them into the unclassified uh, AU category. Some of the more common scenarios when there are AU unclassified that we find are faults due to um, RAM shadow logic. So faults on the input or output of a memory um, could lead you to AU unclassifieds. So you would want to take a look at DRCs to see if there are any A rule violations. If you have any memories, that might be an area to look at. Another area is associated with the uh, clock capture, launch and capture behavior. If you have named capture procedures that restrict which clocks can launch and capture, uh, ATBG won't be able to exercise all the clock domains. So the user may have applied knowingly or unknowingly some restrictions on the clock launch and capture behavior. So another way to look at some of this information, maybe get a different angle of view on this, is to re report statistics based on the clock domains. So de report stat-clock, and let's start with just a summary of that report. So we have everything we just saw plus this panel of information that lists all the clock domains. For each of those clock domains, we'll show what percentage of the total fault population uh, is in that clock domain. And then for that percentage of the fault population, what do you have for relevant coverage in that, uh, in that domain? So obviously clock one is the majority of the faults and we have 93% test coverage. Going down really quickly, the, the one that jumps out is RAM clock, a little over 7% of the faults, has almost zero coverage. 
So the next step is to maybe get into some more details of the RAM clock faults. So again, report statistics uh, dash clock, and rather than summary, let's take a look at RAM clock. Okay, so now we're going to see what's the breakdown for uh, just the fault population of RAM clock. Okay, we have a lot of AUs, almost all of them, in fact, black box, uh, pin constraint, tied cells, we know about those things, and then unclassified, uh, over half of them are unclassified. Now, this doesn't necessarily explain why, but at least we're getting a, an idea that a lot of the unclassifieds are in this clock domain. All right. So another way to look at the details of this is maybe to, again, let's take a look at the list of those faults. So if we write faults and we want to do uh, uh, AU under unclassified for RAM clock, so that's the file name we're going to write to, we want to actually, we want to write out this group of faults right here and take a look at it. So we want to start with dash clock domain, RAM clock, okay, then dash class AU, and then the subcategory is UNC for unclassified. So if we write those out, okay, now let's take a look at uh, the uh, AU, uh, UNC under RAM clock, and start scanning down the list of faults here. Now the first thing that jumps out to me is there are a lot of registers listed here. I see a lot of Qs and QBs, and the first question I have is, well, why, why aren't those registers scanned? All right, so that's something that maybe we want to dig in a little bit. So if, for instance, if I just uh, copy a path name to this uh, one of these right here, let's get out of this here. And for the heck of it, let me just report gate on that particular instance. All right, so reporting the gate here. So we're actually, here's the gate instance here, and we can see all the pins of this, of this cell and what they're connected to. And what immediately jumps out at me here is I'm not seeing an SI for a scan in or an SE for a scan enable. So this appears to be a non-scan flop. Um, and if you dig into this a little bit more, you'll see that a lot of these are non-scan flops. Now, I wouldn't expect uh, non-scan flops to show up as unclassified, because usually with non-scan flops, you would see uh, in the statistics uh, file uh, you'd see a category here called sequential depth, because if there's a non-scan flop, we have to, the HPG has to propagate through um, sequential instances, so you'd see that it would want to change its sequential depth, and if the depth is not sufficient, uh, it would show up as a category here. And another way to look at that, just to kind of confirm, if we report sequential fault uh, depth, this gives you an idea, depending on what you set the sequential fault depth to, uh, what you can expect for test coverage here. And again, this 83% here is virtually what you have for test coverage already. So it's interesting that uh, non-scan flops aren't popping up as a, a sequential depth issue. What that tells me is there's probably some combination of, of conditions here, not only that it's a non-scan flop, or perhaps it's also being blocked by lack of a memory model, uh, so there are a few things going on. I think safe to say, though, go back, scan these flops, rerun ATBG, you'll see your coverage improve and see what other issues there might be.